All right, so we might as well get started. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to finish early to, you know, let you all go about your busy days and maybe have a chance to look at the new resources briefly. Um, I'm Liz Wilkinson. I'm the project manager for the Reimagined Stage 2 project. So this was originally going to be a face-to-face -face meeting, um, but I'm really glad in the end that it's turned out to be a webinar because it means that we're able to welcome people from around the country to join us. Um, so thanks very much for joining us and welcome. First thing, before we go further, we're, we're hosting this from Sydney, which is Gadigal land. And I'd like to welcome Arnie Ann to join us to give us a welcome to country. Hi Elizabeth, I don't know if it's on the screen. Um, we can see you, yeah, great, okay. welcome. Good morning everyone. I certainly bring you a message of respect and caring this morning. And it is indeed a privilege to provide a welcome to country for me. Um, it is certainly a, a profound honour and a luxury of time. Time that has been given by you and time given by many warriors that started the traditions for everyone. And a welcome isn't just words, it's a reflection of where we are. And the, the boundaries of traditional owners are not defined by the hand owner or the pen, but through the natural landscape of our incredible country. And the Eora Nation's country spans from the Hawkes River to the north, the Nepean to the west, and the Georges River to the south. So on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the traditional custodian, who are the custodians of culture, heritage, land and waterways in this particular part of Eora country, it is indeed an honour that I welcome you to the land of the Eora Nation and Gadigal people. And I acknowledge the Gadigal people's spirits and their ancestors, for they shall always remain within their land, our Mother Earth. And whenever you travel across this beautiful continent of ours, you cross the lands of a nation, a tribe and a clan, which have existed and belong to these lands that stretch as far beyond 60,000 years. And First Nations of, of this land, we are the most diverse and unique um, peoples on the planet. We are the oldest living culture of the world. And I certainly need to pay homage to the many warriors that created the pathways for us all. And the ones that are recognised and the ones that we have never heard of. And our journey and milestones will only be realised if we can see, if we can feel, and if we can uh, certainly be a positive difference put into real action. And we must commit to making our world, our society, a better place, breaking through barriers, not creating them. So as you connect, learn and share today and tomorrow and beyond, don't live regretting what should have been done, but create the legacy of what must be done. And I, I certainly needed to just um, say thank you as well to the... Uh, Mental Health um, Coordinating Council, you know, for, for asking me to conduct the work, and it is indeed an honour. Um, and I know that the work that you do is certainly very, very important to um, address issues that impact on us mentally. And, and this, in this uncertain times, Lord knows, it, it's certainly testing everybody. I mean, I've seen so much um, hurt and, and confusion and and people just lashing out, it is really a sad time. But thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey today. And I hope that your um, meeting is certainly a one of success. And, and I, I uh, as I said, I feel very, very honoured um, to be able to, to conduct the work. And I mean, I do this under a great deal of, of um, you know, stress because I'm not computer savvy, but at least I've connected. And, you know, as I said, thank you, thank you for allowing me. There is one request that I ask everybody every time I have the honour to conduct welcome, is for each and every one of us to um, remember our loved ones that have passed over before us, the incredible giants that have allowed each and every one of us to stand on their shoulders, the beautiful people that are beside you and with you now, but more importantly, those gorgeous, precious little ones that follow in our footsteps. So may my people spirit walk and guide all of us as we continue on our journey to create and make our, our, our country the best in the world. So once again, welcome to the land 
of the Eora Nation of the land. This is the land that I'm actually on and welcome to the land that you are on for Aboriginal people. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Connie Ann. I'm so glad that you were able to connect um, and that we managed to sort out those IT issues. Um, you brought tears to my eyes, certainly, so I'm glad I'm not wearing any eyeliner or anything. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you Liz. Time. Bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Laurie Taylor, um, who's our New South Wales ACT peer leader for the project to give an acknowledgement of lived experience. Um, just quickly, Liz, I, I also wanted to say that's the most beautiful welcome to country I've ever heard. I was just blown away. It was beautiful and so generous. So thank you, Auntie Anne. That was lovely. Um, so as Liz said that I'm going to acknowledge lived experience, um, I'd like to acknowledge the diverse experiences that everyone brings here today and acknowledge that between us we provide first-hand knowledge of the experiences of recovery, hope for others and ourselves on, in a continuing nature, of the ongoing possibility of recovery, a greater understanding of the experience of mental illness or caring for a person with a mental illness and the experience of the mental health service system. When I speak about recovery uh, and lived experience um, recovery, I'm speaking about a personal process, a social movement, a paradigm for service delivery, a framework for validating the diversity of human experience and a philosophy for social inclusion, social justice and human rights. Uh, through this project, I've had the privilege of working with others with lived experience. The people that I have met and worked with are some of the most resilient, tenacious, empathetic and generous individuals I've ever met. Our lived experience forms the core of projects like Reimagine Today. So as a person with lived experience, I thank you for sharing your experiences, your skills, your talents and generously giving your time. And I hope you enjoy the Reimagine launch today. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, that was really lovely. Um, I'd now like to hand over to my CEO, uh, Carmel Tabut, and she's gonna give us a couple of opening and welcoming remarks from MHCC. Thanks very much, Liz. And um, Thank you to everyone for joining. I might just check, Liz, you can hear me okay? All good, great. Um, thanks everyone for joining this launch today. Uh, I understand we've got about 200 or more people who are listening in. So that is a really fabulous uh, expression of support uh, for this project. I wanna thank Auntie Anne for her welcome to country uh, and echo the comments of others. It was a very generous and uh, moving welcome to country. I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're standing on and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I also want to acknowledge people with a lived experience and the contribution that they have made to mental health reform in Australia and particularly to this project. And thank you, Laurie, for um, your acknowledgement. We do have special guests on the virtual stage. So I want to acknowledge Jerry Norton, who is the Strategic Advisor on Mental Health for the NDIA, who will be speaking very soon. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Liz Wilkinson, the Project Director, who is emceeing today. Uh, Liz has done a fabulous job of bringing this project together. Um, I also want to acknowledge some people in the audience. We have our NDIA representatives in the audience, Donna and Dean. Thank you uh, for all that you have done to support this project. We've got peer leaders, representatives of the state and territory mental health peaks, and also members of the advisory group. And all of you were really integral to uh, making this project work. Without the funding and support, of course, that the NDIA provided, the project wouldn't have got off the ground. The state and territory peaks provided a base 
and support for the peer leaders. And I do really want to acknowledge my fellow state and territory peaks across Australia because embarking on this project two years ago was something quite new and different for us. And uh, it's been, I think, a really amazing journey. Um, I also want to acknowledge the peer leaders themselves. They've done an amazing job in uh, facilitating the co-design of the resources that are now part of the redesigned website and also developing uh, the peer networks. Back in 2016, when uh, MHCC first developed the reimagine.today website to support people with a psychosocial disability understand and access the NDIS, there weren't a lot of resources around at that stage that really spoke to people with a psychosocial disability. Um, a lot's happened since then. Uh, we acknowledge that there are still challenges for people with mental health conditions in how they access the NDIS. But there's also been a lot of changes to make the scheme work better for people with a psychosocial disability. Things like the development of the psychosocial stream, the recent announcement of the recovery coaches that are soon to commence. There has been a lot of change and MHCC are really proud of the role that we've played in increasing and understanding um, the awareness about the NDIS for people with mental health conditions. So I really want to congratulate everyone involved in this project. This website's been an enormous part of increasing that awareness. A national project with lots of moving parts is never easy to land, but this project has done it and it has resulted in the development of really valuable resources. It's created authentic and lasting relationships and connections, and it has contributed to a greater awareness and understanding about how the NDIS can support people with a psychosocial disability. So others will talk in more detail about the project, but I would now like to move to my primary role, which is to introduce Jerry Norton. As I mentioned earlier, Jerry is the strategic advisor on mental health for the NDIA. And since joining the NDIA, Jerry's made an enormous difference. Um, to the NDIA's understanding of mental health and psychosocial disability. Many of the changes to the scheme that I recently mentioned uh, would not have happened without the leadership that Jerry has shown. Prior to joining the NDIA, Jerry was the CEO of MIND, so he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience and understanding about psychosocial disability and mental health to the NDIA. So, we are very fortunate to have Jerry at the NDIA, and we are very fortunate to have Jerry launch today uh, the Reimagine Doc Today Stage Two project. So thanks very much, Jerry. Look, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all uh, to celebrate the what, and I think it's a celebration of the launch of this new updated website. I'm pleased to be here representing the National Disability Insurance Agency at this launch of this project. As Carmel has said, um, we've supported this project with significant funding. And I really wanted to explain why, why we think this is a really important project and we are, why I think we're really pleased about the way in which the Mental Health Coordinating Council has gone about this project. And I like, all of us look forward to, I think, seeing the sort of work that I think um, Carl, Elizabeth and the team have, have done. So just to set this in context, what we know is that many people who should be receiving support from the NDIS currently aren't receiving support and many people are unaware, surprisingly, of the relevance of the NDIS to their lives. To give you a quick picture, we have 38,000 people with primary psychosocial disability now in the scheme. Our earlier estimates provided by the Productivity Commission said that there would be, they estimated about 64,000 people who should be eligible. And so work that we've done over the last few years with state and territory governments and with organisations like the Mental Health Coordination Council has really tried to focus on saying how can we make sure that the people who should be in the scheme are helped to be in the scheme 
And I think what uh, the Mental Health Coordinating Council is doing and what this project is doing is a very important part of this work of trying to improve access, of improve um, people's both understanding um, and um, particularly information about what the scheme is and what people need to do to get to get into this scheme. So for us, um, we've, as an agency, had for a number of years, had a very sort of positive view about the role of Reimagine Today and its importance for uh, people with mental health in Australia, particularly those involved or thinking about the NDIS. So we're delighted that this is a further, I think, improvement to that, to that website. I suppose from our perspective, particularly um, the areas of focus that you have looked at, that is people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, people from LGBTIQ plus communities, people from multicultural call communities, and people living in rural and remote areas have been your priorities because for us, they are still the priorities. We still have a need to reach out uh, and provide information to these groups. So congratulations really to Elizabeth and her team, to Carmel and the Mental Health Coordinating Council for what um, you um, have achieved today. The, the second point I suppose I wanted to mention was we are delighted that this work you have done is grounded in, in the lived experience of people with mental health and the notion of peers and peer work. This is uh, being recognised within the agency as being increasingly important. I'm really it's an interesting coincidence that today, May the 29th, is the day that we are releasing the details of a new support item, uh, which we're calling Psychosocial Recovery Coaches. And one of the features that, of this um, uh, support item, which is really trying to focus, bring back a focus on recovery uh, within the scheme and the funding of recovery, but has a very clear focus on uh, funding of peer workers as recovery coaches in an equal way to the way in which we'd fund staff with learnt experience. And so we see this um, as a very significant uh, affirmation and confirmation of the role of peers in the delivery of supports for people with primary psychosocial disability within the scheme. We have worked up this concept now over the last uh, eight months, and we've had enormous contribution from people with lived experience, service providers, and families and carers in its development. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the information that will be coming out, um, particularly over the next month in regards to this role, and think about its relevance for you as an individual, if you're a participant, or for you as a service provider or a family and carer member. So it's a great co coincidence. So just to, to close by saying congratulations to everybody. I, like everyone else, look forward uh, to uh, seeing some of the details of the, the website. And um, I hope the rest of the event goes really well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, thanks for helping put the project into a bit of context and um, I think I'd like to also comment uh, thanks to the NDIA and to MHCC um, because I feel like you both um, organisations gave me or agencies gave me um, the freedom to be accountable to the peer leaders and to the participants in the project um, which I think is ultimately what it should be about. So thanks to MHCC and the NDIA. Um, I also wanted to thank our many uh, project partners again. Um, Carmel's mentioned them as well, but there were quite a lot of organisations that had a significant um, role and contribution to this project. So many thanks um, to all of you and all of the people that work for those organisations. Um, just briefly, um, Carmel sort of mentioned 
uh, reimagine itself um, is a fantastic resource. It was um, launched in partnership between MHCC, the NDIA and people with lived experience in 2017. And it's really on the back of how useful and well received this um, website has been that we're able to do the um, reimagined stage two project. I imagine most of the people online are already familiar with the original website. So I'll press on um, with funding from the NDIA through the National Information Linkages and Capacity Building Grants round two, we've had funding to deliver reimagined stage two over two years. And it's really about increasing access to the NDIS by people with psychosocial disabilities, in particular through the further enhancement of the Reimagine Today website. Um, there's a few main activities that we've had as part of this project. Today we're focusing on launching the, the new version of the website, but the peer leaders, and I should stress the, the importance of the peer leaders in this work, it's, a, it's been peer-led activities and they've, run networks in each of their states and territories, excluding WA. So there were six peer-led networks across the country and we um, recorded thousands of contacts through those networks, both face-to-face, -face, uh, phone, fa Facebook, email and online meetings. Um, these groups would discuss the NDIS um, and it included consumers, carers and other supports um, and talking about their experience of the NDIS and what support and information is available, such as the Reimagine Today website. So it's a bit about a promotional exercise of Reimagine Today, but really conversations with people in um, how, how we can make people's access journey for the NDIS smoother. Um, and I think more powerful than the, the thousands of contacts that we've counted through the project um, is the, the difference that um, people felt individually. So we were able to capture some stories of change. Um, for example, this one. Um, this came from a participant that worked with one of our peer leaders and they'd applied twice for the NDIS. Um, both times they failed to meet access requirements and they talked with one of our peer leaders and they encouraged them to apply again and not, not give up. And that was, a, that was a big message that came through from this project is not to give up if your first application is rejected. Um, they got in contact with DAS with the support of the peer leader and started the application process again and their access request was put in and they got a call from the NDIS and they'd met access and it was life changing. Um, that's just an excerpt of that story, but I think those individual stories really highlight um, the value in, in this kind of work. Um, a second main component of the project was the co-design processes with the diverse communities and that was co-facilitated by the peer leaders and facilitators from within those communities. Um, it was in partnership with peak bodies representing those communities as well. So as Jerry mentioned we had a focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and one of the things that I found really challenging from day one of this project is, as many of you are also aware, there's a lot of diversity within each of these diverse communities. So I thought we're not going to be able to do justice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people nationally, but we can work with a couple of communities and see with those communities if we can create what I would call sort of a, a gift from the community of Sherberg in Queensland to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around Australia. So there was a group in Darwin and NT and in Sherberg in Queensland and this picture's um, actually I took this when I was lucky to go up with Brooke to visit the community there and that's back in June last year. 
Um, this is from a group that I ended up running. I actually also have lived experience. So um, that was part of what I brought to the table for this group. And I co-facilitated with Maria Kachirisa. She's fantastic. That's why I'm naming her. She's absolutely fantastic. And she co-facilitated this group with me at M-Dime Granville. Um, and this is back in September at the second co-design. Uh, I, I added this photo because I think for me it highlights um, the value in asking people what they want. Um, I, I was hesitant with this photo. I thought, is that not conveying some kind of a, a stereotype? But um, the participants in the groups um, that Laurie, our uh, peer leader in New South Wales, ran both of these groups, both a Sydney group in New South Wales and an online national group. The participants um, said they liked this photo because some people hoped that with the support of an NDIS plan that they might um, one day be able to attend a party. And this made them think of that. So I thought that that was really beautiful. And, and I think, you know, for me highlighted why it's sometimes it's worth asking people what their perspective is. Um, we had two rural and remote groups as well, and they were in Launceston in Tasmania, ran, run by our peer leader in Tasmania, Astrid, and in Sejuna in South Australia, um, run by our peer leader there, Kristen. Um, and this is a photo from Astrid's group back in July last year. Um, Overwhelmingly, what came from each of those groups is that people wanted um, representation um, to be able to relate to the people that they see and the resources to the people that are getting support from the NDIA or the NDIS, um, to have stories shared, um, to hear people's experiences of the NDIS and to hear people from within their own communities, stories and experiences of the NDIS. Um, they overwhelmingly wanted messages to be clearer, you know, as usual, there's, there's too much jargon, too much complication and people just want things in plain English and where possible in their own language, um, own first language. And people want things to be relevant. So they want things that are relevant to their own experience of the world, not, again, as I was mentioning, one of the challenges when you're a, a Sydney-based organisation is people think, well, how are you going to make something that's relevant to my experience when I live in Sajina, South Australia, because it's very different. Um, so finally, capacity building, that's the third kind of main component of this project. We had skill building workshops that ran across the country, at least one or more in each of the participating states and territories. And um, we focused on skill building for the NDIS journey, which initially focused on self-advocacy, decision-making and self-management of an NDIS plan. But it evolved over to time kind of to focus really just on skills that you might like to build for the NDIS journey, which ended up being more of a focus on self-advocacy, decision-making and self-care. Um, after the skill building workshops, that led into a co-design process with the peer leader team. And that's contributed to the building of new skill building resources that are hosted now on the new Reimagine Today website. Um, and that was, again, it was a special part of the project for me because the peer leader team was able to come together a few times in Sydney and a couple of times over Zoom um, to connect. And I don't know, that was a really valuable time for me uh, to be able to share and learn from each other's experiences. Um, oh, well, here we go. Laurie, welcome. Hello again. Hello again. Um, Laurie, um, peer leader in New South Wales ACT, kindly agreed to do a bit of a Q&A with me. Um, so thank you very much for joining, Laurie. Um, so 
Um, to start, I think something people struggle with in this space is kind of reconciling recovery and the NDIS context. So what does recovery mean to you and how do you think that it fits here? Um, so recovery to me has significantly changed since I started on this project. Uh, I would have to say that even though I've worked in community engagement and disability and mental health um, before, I'd only really, um, and, and I had seen different um, ideas about recovery for myself, I'd only really seen it in terms of a medical model, uh, which personally I don't find terribly hopeful. Um, so I would say that the way, the change in the way I feel about recovery is honestly from engaging with others on this project. Um, which has been really freeing and empowering. And I think of recovery as a curvy rather than a linear process with a, a start and stop, like suddenly you're, you're recovered. Um, and I think that that can help people to see differences for the possibilities for their life. Um, and also just acknowledging that recovery means different things for different people and even even to myself on different days. So thinking about that concept of recovery in the NDIS context is really important. Um, I think that resources to support individuals identify their strengths and their resilience can build on positive feelings around self-worth, uh, which, which we all need anyway, right? Just to, just to navigate the world. But I think it's particularly important when you're collecting documentation, identifying areas of need that, that may then make um, an NDIS plan accessible to you to support you with your future dreams and goals. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, so next, uh, one of the components of this work was to connect uh, with peer-based networks, um, talking to consumers, carers and workers um, in the sector about the NDIS and our website. Um, I know we, we struggled a lot at the beginning of this project to um, know whether people would find value in those networks and to, to try and make those networks me and conversations meaningful. Um, you joined the project a bit later but I feel like you you really took to that work what was what was your experience of the networking um I really I really enjoyed it I think that everyone that works in this space um and and that has lived experience um is really passionate about their their role and where they sit within this space um, so I ended up connecting with groups ranging from community, community support, you know, really grassroots organisations that were run by one or two volunteers, um, all the way through to large funded organisations. Um, but I also spoke with individuals, some of whom were linked in with supports. So I think that speaking to a wide range of organisations and individuals meant that I got a lot of well, I got really broad feedback for Reimagine today, and I found that travelling to areas, or I, the caveat to that is that I ended up having to zoom instead of travel to to most um, areas, but it was really worthwhile, um, and I got feedback from some organisations um, that you know, it was that they were already using our resources and how helpful they were already finding them. Um, but it was it was also helpful to see the same concerns that everyone had across the board um, or the same issues, but then issues that were related to specific areas where Reimagine could help as well. Okay, yeah, wonderful. And I think especially working with you as well I think the take-home message for me was that it's it's worth reaching out it's worth having those conversations even if they don't stay at that original target they they're worth worth reaching out and talking to people um 
So another part of the project was being part of the peer leader team and I was interested to know your, your thoughts on what it was like being part of the peer leader team across the country. Um, it was it was great. It was really supportive um, talking to the other peer leaders. This is the first time I've been in a peer leader role, so it was really great to um, meet and chat and get support from the other peer leaders. And we were although we we're working on the same project. Um, so we could share ideas and advice, but obviously we had different um, diversity groups and we're in different parts of Australia, but it was just really nice. It was sort of a judgment-free zone where we could discuss challenges and talk through possible options. So I think that worked really well. Yeah, wonderful. And I found, although I wasn't a peer leader, I found the same. It was wonderful to be a part of that. Um, do you think, Therefore, it was good to have peer-based roles in the project context. So I know um, we've discussed this before that uh, peer-based roles and project-based roles are generally quite different um, and, and often require different skill sets. But I think that part of the trust and the rapport that the peer leaders were able to build with the diversity groups was due to participants knowing we have lived experience. So I think that that was really important as a component of the project. Um, and as peer leaders, we weren't actually taking on the roles of peer support workers. You know, it's quite, it's quite different. So I think the challenge was making sure that all of the project needs were met in a way that really authentically demonstrated the information participants had shared, but then also maintaining those boundaries of a peer leader role so just balancing I guess the the role of peer leader and and a project based role um, but I would definitely say that peer leaders having lived experience brings a real awareness of the barriers of participation and being heard and all of the peer leaders from what what I saw worked really hard to ensure that that co-design process was as accessible as possible and truly reflected the participants in the groups. Absolutely. Um, and that's a good segue to my next question, which is co-design. Um, that's something that featured heavily in our project and in my mind throughout the project. And I know it's, it's a topic of interest for a lot of people. So what is co-design to you and what do you think worked well or not so well for us? Um, so co-design is a process where participants are respected as equal partners sharing their expertise working toward a common goal. Um, that's actually part of a uh, definition of co-design if you like. Um, I, I, the way I kind of see it is that it's it's, it, it's more than that. It's, it's saying you're actually the expert here in this area and we, we need your expertise, your skills and your experience um, to truly reflect what, what we're trying to achieve with this project and, and the outcomes that we're looking for. So co-design to achieve that really needs to be inclusive and um, participatory. And part of that is recognising the barriers to participation and really um, working to overcome those as much as possible. Um, it's authentic in ensuring as much as possible diverse representation of the community participating. So you mentioned earlier with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups that um, you realised that it needed to be narrowed down to a certain number of communities um, to try to get that authenticity in those areas that, that you could then use in other ways for the project. Um, it, it depends on all of the participants feeling safe to have an equal voice uh, and feeling safe to share experiences to create the resources which authentically re uh, represent the agreed needs of the group. And I thought it worked really well. And um, the evaluations indicate that it did. So in terms of you asked about challenges, I would say a challenge was for me being unable to provide the last face-to-face -face workshop 
because of COVID um, restrictions, we had to make it a webinar. And that took a little bit of working around just to ensure that everyone was still able to participate in a meaningful way because there are reasons people choose face-to-face -face rather than webinars. Um, but overall, I would say that it really ensured that the resources built um, have been developed by participants for participants. And I had a few people in my co-design group say that they wish that they had had these resources when they were applying. So it, it was a really great experience. That's quite powerful. And so as we're about to look briefly at some of the resources we've created through this project, um, what do you think about what your groups have created and whether these will be used? I certainly hope they'll be used. <laughs> um, I, I really love the resources that, that the group created. So um, I was working with people from within LGBTIQ plus communities. Uh, so there are specific support resources around LGBTIQ plus communities. But as with all the resources that I think we're briefly looking at today that were co-designed, uh, they can definitely be used across all communities. Um, so certainly we've got resources, all of the peer leaders that have utility for everyone and then there's some specific resources in there uh, that acknowledge each of the diverse group's unique needs. Um, so the group I worked with thought that it was really important to acknowledge the challenges with the NDIS as well as the successes. So some of the group were interviewed on video talking about a range of topics, but it was including challenges that they've faced and then the strategies that they've used to overcome those challenges. And that was really, really powerful. And again, that could be used for, for anyone really. Um, I think that anyone watching them would be able to identify with those challenges and then also get hopefully get some really great ideas for managing any barriers that they might encounter. Um, but there's also some really great examples in those videos of how an NDIS plan has helped to support goals. And some of those um, ideas are kind of really out of the box ideas, which, which I think is really helpful for anyone looking at it um, and thinking, wow, I didn't realise I could use an NDIS plan for that. Mm -hmm. So the online resources give personal stories as well as examples of areas identified as important to NDIS participants. Things like respectful service provision. Um, so there's, there's some resources around that, some suggestions on how to manage it. And they're really helpful because they actually address day-to-day -day concerns and some planning, pre-planning about how you might want to manage that. So you're not kind of caught out on the spot. Um, we talked a lot about how people often need to advocate for themselves or have a chosen support to do so. And self-advocacy can be really challenging for many people, um, that idea of speaking up and maybe being perceived as being pushy or um, difficult to work with or what have you. Uh, and, you know, it can feel really confronting, especially if you've been used to a model that doesn't ask for your opinion on your own care. Mm -hmm. So the resources created have a lot of support around building those skills and acknowledging that it can be really tricky. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure people are looking forward to seeing them. Um, and last question, based on your experience through this project, what advice would you like to leave other people with lived experience? Oh, I'd like to leave them a lot of advice. Um, but uh, I would say that the strength of the resources is really acknowledging the barriers and challenges faced by um, people with lived experience, carers and chosen supports. Um, so really kind of going into the nuts and the bolts and saying, yep, these are some of the difficulties that 
that we're acknowledging. But then also, um, rather than just talking about the difficulties, also saying, yep, yeah, but here's some stories of strategies that have worked for me and some really great successes. So really being real about the whole process. Um, I think it also helps to encourage people to celebrate little steps and rather than looking at challenges as a big or one big challenge, really breaking it down into manageable chunks. Um, I think that all of the resources really help with that, but the workbook particularly can help with that, the way that um, people choose to use it. So I would really hope that people look through Reimagine today and find a place where they feel understood um, where their resilience and strengths are acknowledged, but most importantly, where they actually find hope for their future. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you so much for agreeing to have a chat with me today. Thank you for having me. I do love to have a chat. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone else knows. <laughs> um, all right, so without further ado, um, and for those of you that haven't already had a sneak peek, I'm going to just jump over to the website. Um, so I know I did promise in our promotional material that it would be all about showing you the resources, but I think you'll be better off having a look at them yourselves. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier, representation was a big thing that came out of our co-design processes. So People just want to see pictures of people that they might relate to on the website. So there's a lot of photos throughout. Um, we just try to simplify things a bit. As I mentioned earlier, the Reimagine Today resource as it was, was already fantastic. So we haven't really changed the core material that was there, made the English a bit more plain um, and did things like took the swirly symbols that were on the front away and put replace them with some some for some people this would be a bit simpler i'm, I'm for example somebody that found the, the swirls a bit overwhelming and i know that there were other people that related to that um, one of the things that we were asked to do um, was do a simple app which you can download now from the app store i think you just search reimagine today in your respective app store and you can download an app there it's it's a simple app just like the workbook a place to store information about yourself um, it's a partner resource to go with the website it's not a standalone and it, you can do things like put phone numbers in there and reminders for appointments and that sort of thing but it's not um, stored on a cloud or anything so it is really just your own information in your own app, it's not in any kind of a database. So you're welcome to um, go in there. Um, we've got a, an acknowledgements page, it's one of our news pages, um, acknowledging our partners and the many people that were involved. I tried to get everybody's names in there, but let me know if I've missed anybody. There was quite a lot of people and it was wonderful to meet so many of those people and to have some really wonderful chats. There's a couple of new pages. Um, mental health, stigma and discrimination was a topic that people wanted to hear more about. Um, in particular, my group in Sydney, uh, which was a multicultural group we ran in Granville, they thought that before starting talking about um, the NDIS, and psychosocial disability, you need to start by talking about mental health stigma and discrimination. So that's part of why that's there. I also had a chat to a couple of ladies that are carers of people with a primary disability that is not psychosocial disability. And we, we added this page together, which is some basic tips for when psychosocial disability is not your primary disability. Um, certainly a lot of people whose primary disability is not psychosocial disability also um, experience psychosocial disability. So it's just some tips, fairly simple tips there for them as well. Um, 
self-care hub. As I mentioned, self-care became one of the things that the peer leaders and I focused on as a skill to build for the journey for the NDIS because it, it can be a difficult process for a lot of people um, and we definitely hear that a lot from people that experience psychosocial disability. So there's just a few things there that people can do or they can um, click on how they're feeling about the situation and get some ways that they might be able to respond in, 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 in that feeling. Um, there's some advice from other participants. And again, this is really building on resources that were on the original website, but giving it a, a location, a hub for people to go to where it's all together. Um, and now we've embedded the resources throughout from the, the po priority population um, co-design processes. We've embedded some of those resources throughout and we maybe will embed more of those resources throughout. But one of the things that came first from the community in Sherberg, actually, they said that they wanted a hub for their mob. They wanted an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's hub. Um, and so we had a few conversations with the different groups and we ended up deciding to do a hub for each of the communities and their community hubs. Um, so I invite you all to have a look through those. While the resources that are designed by and for people from within those communities, they're all really accessible and interesting to anyone, I would say. So please feel free to have a look. Um, this is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander People's Hub. And you can see this uh, NDIS logo that was designed by the people in Sherberg to make it more accessible. They thought to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and it includes um, some symbols that they related to. And this was one beautiful resource that we wanted to share. I'll, sh I'll share it with you now because we're almost out of time. I promised to run short and now we've, we've, we've gone to time. So I'll show Elaine's story to you now. But maybe yeah, it's just no, I think it's, I think it's me. I think I wasn't giving you guys any sound, so hopefully you have it now. It was helpful. I didn't know. Different now. Didn't understand. Now, the color of the road. And there I is gone. You know, young man, one of my own. One of my own. I got one of my own. Thank 
kawangan walang bangun aku baik una walang aku lupa na ayi yang walang na wal tubulu jama main makum program yang ini edis pun program itu main mak itu main mak kiri mana yang akan mulai walang para yang nak pun walang uli uli edis pun program para yang nak pun hunting le kama walang fishing bo o hunting may par na winakon yung ka lajin ulan na maras agul na kundul wala ng kawal na wala lang yung pijan na winakon no ko malayun ba yung wala kodi sa mga ano cha mga sa pasukan Kami di mana pun boleh pressure ni tu extra, kumpai orang orang ni tu mara mara. Jadi ni tu ni nak mana kerja awak, jadi kumpai ni kumpai ni tu kerja mana dia ramu mana dia ramu. Ia pernah ni tu kumpai orang orang ni nak pun. Kalau kumpai orang orang ni dia selagi ni pun, program tu dia ni ada pun malam malam jatuh kerja mara ni yang tu. Kamu kau ni kan nak mengajar kita. Only we to my program for mental health go around, mental people go. You are trying to go by and say, oh, no matter for you to improve the night down. Yep, again, my dear, me, should be all over to meet with a family, uh, only time, couple of number now, we, and there is what the woman and the third planning to run a young company. Apabila dengan kita lebih strong to help kita boleh family to know not well in the IS Miami, keep it strong for our life for future generation. Whatever we are, balanda yang lumus pulana, tu adalah yang most important thing yang kita main di mulut life for program. I'm not going to go to MBIS, Miami. Wonderful. So, apologies that my... Um, I wanted to mute myself, but I muted the video as well. Um, so... We're basically out of time, so um, thank you all for joining. Um, big acknowledgements to Sarah, our peer leader in the NT, who was responsible for that video as one of the many resources that come out of the Reimagine Stage 2 project. Congratulations, Sarah. And many thanks to Sarah and to Astrid and Charles and Kristen and Brooke and Laurie and Beck, who's our project officer, and everybody else that has made a contribution to this project. Um, thank you so much. Um, and please contact us with any feedback or questions at reimagine at mhcc.org.au. Thanks. Bye. Have a look at the new website. Take care.